welcome. This is the Skill Points Podcast. Uh, my name is Steve Swink, and with me today is Nels Anderson, who hey, is buddy. a design programmer. Hello, my friend. Uh, you may have heard of Mark of the Ninja, which he was the lead designer on, which sold, I looked this up actually, multiple millions of copies now. I mean, it's been in like humble bundles and stuff, so. But I mean, across all the platforms, whatever. But I mean, pub... <laughs> a, a large number of human beings may have played it, and that warms the cockles of my heart. Yes, yes, and it warms the cockles of my heart too, because it's a game that is near and dear to my heart. Because as I told you, when the game came out and I played it, I am so happy that there was finally a proper sequel to Tenchu, which is one of my favorite games of <laughs> That's all right, time. That's right, I remember that. <laughs> of all time. Um, you mean anyway, you're telling I... me you you don't love Tenchu three from? from software creators of Demon Souls and Dark Souls? <laughs> I have no memory about what you might be speaking. <laughs> they found their stride. That's all I'll, I'll say about that. A lot, yes, they used to have a... Uh, yeah, correct. <laughs> they, they also made that... What was, what was I already forgot. The, they also made that Connect mech game that was very oh, terrible. Yeah. So okay, wait, wait. Are we From... getting off the rails already? All right, let me, yeah, let sorry, me finish, let me finish your intro. <laughs> so, uh, Mark of the Ninja has sold millions of copies, has tons and tons of awards. Uh, maybe most in, interestingly and impressively, it's one of the highest rated games on Steam. If you take the number of ratings and compare it to the percentage rating, which you can oh. do, which you can do on Steam Spy. So it, it's definitely Steam oh, cool. Steam audience catnip, which is really nice. But I think it's a really fantastic game. And sometimes games that I think are really great Aww. don't do really amazingly well. And it makes me really happy that this one did. Um, well, and your most recent project after you left Clay Entertainment is Firewatch. That's which right. Which I actually only finished playing fairly recently um, oh. because I have a long backlog. And I really love it. I think it's really, really good. And I think that uh, Mark of the Ninja and Firewatch both have probably top five of my favorite stories in games ever so i want to talk to you a little bit about that too oh man yeah wow. <laughs> I know, i'm not <laughs> and it's just a puff off our buddies cast well and but i can i can back up my reasons why i can reflect at you why i think that is because i mean i obviously i don't think that they're perfect games but i do think that in the case of those two stories you guys did a really good job of taking the story and marrying it to the game with the minimum of fluff like you really applied that razor and cut off everything that wasn't important. But anyway, thank you. Oh, and and very and recently, you and your wife uh, released a human child. That's right. She did, <laughs> she did most of the hard. She work. did most of the hard work on that one. Yeah, we, we should probably <laughs> give credit where credit's due. Um, yeah. But yeah, congratulations. So thanks so much, Madhu, for taking the time. My pleasure. He's asleep, so it's cool. <laughs> That's great. That's fantastic. Yeah, it sounds like he's he's actually being pretty good from what you're saying. Pretty pretty sleepable. He's, he's an ace baby for sure. That's pretty radical. Okay, um, I am going to do present, which lets you see my screen. Is that right? So if I uh, if I click to something else, can you see something that's not just my face? Nope. No. <laughs> okay, wait. Right, let's do. There we go. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Cool. Yes. So that would be that would be yes. normal view, and then okay. So I'm just gonna do my little uh, intro for anyone who hasn't watched the one other episode of the podcast that was starring Davy <laughs> Reedon to get the concept behind it. So the idea is essentially based on the research of this guy, Andrews Erickson, who has a book called Peak, and he studies peak performance. He is the world expert in world experts, and uh, <laughs> you may have heard That's a of. Good quip. It, it, well, it's, yeah, and, and I, he's such a funny, like, sort of humble, sort of Swedish guy who always sounds really, like, tired when people talk to him. So it's funny when, <laughs> when people say that, like, Anders Ericsson, you're the world expert in world experts. He's like, ah, oh, yes. Well, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you about the research. Um, but, it, but so I, I like to talk about deliberate practice uh, as it relates to game design. Uh, because I think that not very many people think about it. And there's this really interesting, unique opportunity that appears when you start to investigate uh, this type of practice as it applies to knowledge work fields generally and specifically game design. Um, so basically, when... Yeah, uh, I, I, got a, I got a question for you about this, but finish finish the spiel for context first. Yeah, I'll do the, I'll do the context spiel. Uh, but anyway, so uh, have you ever played an instrument? I think I asked you this, right? Yeah, you did, right? Nope. No. Never, ever. Have you ever done a sport? Uh, badly. badly. I rock climb. Rock climb. That's kind of a sport. No, that's totally one. Yeah, and so, so um, you know, you can do a lot of rock climbing, uh, but never really get that much better at it. Just the way that you can like practice an instrument. Uh, right. For example, a guitar. A bunch of times you can practice a song that you like. For example, like 
Rage Against the Machine or something like that. And you keep playing the song, playing the song, playing the song. You never really get that much better at it. And one of the, the interesting findings of the deliberate practice research is that this type of noodling, um, there's a reason why you don't get any better if you just kind of keep playing it. And, and the reason is that there are different types of practice, and some of them are much more effective than others. And this is what they call in the literature naive practice. So you can just noodle, noodle, noodle. And everyone who plays guitar or has ever really thought about playing an instrument seriously knows that you can noodle, noodle, noodle on a song. And you can do that for a month or months, and you never really get any better. But the way to actually get better is to zoom in on a particular area of the song and play the notes uh, very slowly. One tenth speed is a very common way to do it. You focus, you figure out where you suck in the song, <laughs> where you always mess up, and then you play those sections over and over and over and over again ad nauseum until you cannot mess them up, right? And then now you've really, del you've deliberately focused on the areas where you're weak, you've gotten much better, and they call this purposeful practice, and this is how you get better, and they've actually done the research on this. This is like the practice which is, you know, uh, a, mo a month of crappy noodling around is worth like an hour of this kind of practice. Like this kind of practice is just so insanely better. Uh, and this right. and there and there are heights that no you just can't even reach if you're not right. applying this type of practice, right? And so for the record, this is the the purposeful practice thing. And then they go one step further and they talk about deliberate practice. So purposeful practice has you know you have to have specific goals for what you're practicing. So um, we'll talk about how we might apply that to game design later. Uh, it requires really deep and intense focus, constant feedback, and then you have to sort of live out of your comfort zone. Um, yeah, anyway, so then they go on to talk about deliberate practice, and they talk about how things like pop music and um, knowledge work, <laughs> you can't actually have deliberate practice because it requires two things that purposeful practice doesn't have, which is you have to have a coach, um, and uh, you need to have, like, clear metrics, like for example, uh, in international chess, there's like actual numbers, right? And you can't really do that with game design. You can kind of say, oh, the number of sales you've got, but that's not a very good metric or number of players, yada, yada, yada. So it's a little bit more yeah. wooly, but it is really, really worth trying to figure those things out, I think. Yeah. I, think well, I mean, it, that, yeah, that's the interesting. So this is, this is where like, when I heard you talk about this stuff initially, I was like, oh yeah, deliver access, that's so cool. But then I thought about it a little bit more and I wonder like, because I haven't read Erickson's book yet, although I want to. Um, like, I don't know if they get into this, but like, it's with practicing an instrument or like running or whatever, you do have that very specific, like, defined goal, that source of truth, right? Like, you have sheet music where it literally just has the goddamn right. notes. And if you're right, you're like, oh, I played an F sharp. And if you're wrong, you didn't play an F sharp. But when you're designing a thing, you don't like, your goal is like, it's. It's good, and that's all you got, right? Right, right. Well, so let's let's dive into it then. Um, let's dive into the actual skills of what you specifically do, and we're going to shave it into ever finer wafers until we can get down to something that's a little more concrete. Because I was talking about this with Davey, right? It's like, oh, what what would you practice to be good at game design? Well, I mean, right, like, blah, right. That's yeah. way too way too much stuff. So let me ask you this. This is the question I like to start with. What is the best piece of work that you ever did? Oh, how granular are we talking here? <laughs> um, at a sort of day-to-day -day level, not like what was the best whole game you worked on, and not was like, not was like. Right. There aren't that many of those. <laughs> right? Yeah. There's sort of two, you know, two or three, right? Because you worked at yeah. Hothead briefly before. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. yeah. So I, I technically have title ship credits on four games, and then like a trivial amount of work in maybe one or two more. Yeah. So I mean, what what is the best piece of work within one of your pieces of work? Oh. Man, that's a good question. Um, oh. I mean, if we're trying to talk about a specific, I mean, it's so hard to think about like an entire bit of systems design because that's so big and blobby and amorphous. But if we're talking about like a specific bit of content, which I don't know if that's the right way to think about it or not, but whatever, I think that the one, two, three, the fourth level of Ninja is pretty darn good in the sense that like, it's far enough away from the beginning of the game that the training wheels have come off. Like right. it's kind of the one where it sort of, sort of asks you to be good, um, but it's also the one where we're you're kind of far enough away from the beginning that we can kind of give the player a bit more rope. Like that level is as much as you can in a level based two D right. platformy type game. It's it's not like strictly beginning to end structured like it has multiple different paths and there's like some number of objectives that you can choose to meet or not meet. And it's kind of like all the all this stuff that is really good in a sneaky, stealthy, 
really like heavy player agency type game is all present there um but it's still early up and early early along in the game enough so that like people are still it, it's not it's not rote yet i mean like i i like to think it's part of it's hard to say for sure part of the reason why ninja is good is like as levels move on it's always trying to mix it up but mm -hmm. There's still like there's the mixing it up because you were used to it and it feels like about like that fourth level is when you're just like starting to get all the fundamentals and now that's the point when the game says all right you really got to perform now right and I, if if i recall correctly that's where like the dogs start to come in and stuff but the dogs show up in level three level four is the one where there's like that you actually you start by going to the left instead of to the right oh. and there's that big old building you got to set on fire basically right Okay. Yeah. So okay. So how did you how did you do that? Um, like at a at a moment to moment but in seat level, like what were you doing? What were you clicking on? What were you thinking about? How, you know, how did you make it good? Why? What? How did it start? Did it start magically good the first time you did it, or did it? You know. Get... Nothing does, Steve. You've been a video game before. <laughs> yes. That's a bit of a straw man question for you there, but <laughs> but um, I mean, you know, so like, yeah, so so bring us along. Like, what 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 were the skills that you were applying and the insights that allowed you to craft yeah. it into what it became? I mean, this is kind. Of, so we'll probably get into this later when we maybe talk about the differences between working on Firewatch versus Ninja. But I, like, as far as like tangible skills that apply broadly to design is concerned, because like the skills you need to have is you know like making a 2D stealth game, for example, are generally like pretty different than if you're making like a 3D third person cover shooter versus like a weird first person narrative exploration game, right? Right, yeah. But the ones, at least one of the types of skills that cuts across all of that is being able to like, you know, have a clear set of, I mean, emotional is almost too loaded of a word, but like aesthetic or gameplay goals or whatever. Yeah. And then being able to sit a human being down in front of the thing you made watch them play it and then see in what places it does and does not meet those goals and thus know what you need to do within the framework of this weird friggin' artifice that you're building like the stuff you have to change in there to move it closer toward what you want it to be well so let, let's get really specific then i mean the, the you know one of the antidotes to that big nebulous like um, skills that apply to all game design problems is just to like chuck that out the window and just say it's very specifically for Mark of the Ninja, for level four, what were you thinking about and worrying about right. and considering? And you, you sort of started to touch on it by talking about like what's good about a stealth game, which is you sort yeah. of give the player, a, you know, I, I'll reflect back a little bit at you and then let you kind of uh, go. But I, what it, one of the things that is really, really good about Mark of the Ninja is that it has that quality of a system which is very well thought out where all the pieces interrelate as much as possible so there's lots of different tools and then there's lots of different things in the environment and then the combinatorial effects of those are very um they're almost like improv comedy in the sense that they always want to answer yes correct <laughs> not not that accident <laughs> yes no i would not um, imagine that they were yeah so that was kind of from the beginning you know when we're like we're, we're articulating even it's like what well, what about this type of game is interesting in general right um i gave a talk at gdc about this way back in 2013 13 spring of 2013 mm -hmm. um but it's it's the, the kind of the, the the crux of it was is that in terms of the moment to moment gameplay what we do in ninja is actually very different than what a lot of other stealth games do right because a lot of stealth games are about like oh you know you have to spend a lot of time internalizing the way the systems in the game work so then you can utilize that information to exploit that stuff and we're just like we're just gonna chuck all of that and we're just gonna be like the information you need is going to be put on the screen so when a noise is made you don't have to be like okay well that guy over there, he heard it, so he was close enough, but that guy slightly further than him, he wasn't, so now I have some notion. It's like, no, 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 we just draw a semi-transparent circle on the screen, and if that circle touches a dude's ears, he will, he heard it, and if it didn't, he didn't. Well, um, and, and that was one of the brilliant sort of fundamental decisions before you even got started was like, all right, this is going to be 2D, and 2D, we're really going to lean into that hard because of how, how much that affords you as, in terms of visual clarity. Exactly. Um, so, but the idea was, is like, okay, well, why is being able to understand those systems interesting? And it's because, and this is kind of why stealth games in general, I think, are interesting and cool and so distinct, is that they're games that are way more about um, 
like planning than they are than most other like 3D, not even 3D, but like uh, the, you know third the uh, Avatar based action adventure games, yeah, right? Sure, like yeah. most of those games are about like you know oh some stuff happens and you have to react to it either like literally enemies or like oh there's these weird platforms in front of you react to them now or whatever. But with stealth games, you're like you're always thinking like two or three steps ahead, right? Where you're like okay, well if I do this, then it's gonna make this other guy do this thing, and then that's going to make this thing happen over here, and that's the thing I want to happen. So how do I make that occur, right? Um, and so then we're just like, okay, well, how could, that's the goal we want. Like, that's the actual gameplay objective. There you go. You found it. <laughs> um, yeah, but that, I mean, like, it, it's, it sounds a little bit hokey because it's almost like, oh, what are your pillars? But the truth is it's like, okay, you know, you look around the environment. You see what your options are. You come up with some plan to get to what you want, and that plan is both, like, informed by this stuff <laughs> in your environment, but also like your, your, your uh, just approach of play style, right? Where like, obviously the big high level decision is, do I want to stab some fools or not? But then there's even more low level stuff where it's like, oh, I, I think explo exploiting like the, the terror fear system is really interesting. So how can I solve this problem in a way that does that? Um, and then you put together that plan and then you try to make it happen. And if it does, so wheat. And if it didn't, you deal with that. Um, so how do you so if you're you're designing this level right you're at level four and you're you're doing you're being a great designer in terms of thinking about where this is going to come in the progression and you know you're doing all this you're doing a good job of all this kind of stuff um how specifically are you like when you're when you're trying to build a level where you're giving the player a zillion different options but you're like trying to prune those options really carefully and you but you're like zeroed in you know exactly where they're on the game like the way that you described it before like the training wheels are off so now we can finally start to do some really fun stuff from my right. my perspective as the designer um but we don't want to just you know slam the player in the face because they still need to be able to play it <laughs> um, but we've got all these things where they can like they can they can make up their own goals. They can decide they want to do the terror thing. Like they, I, I'm gonna like reload this level until I hang this guy up the light post and then make the other guy see it. And then he pisses his pants and then I stab him while that's <laughs> happening. Right? Like from your perspective as a designer, uh, you had okay, you're on draft one of this level, and that's that's maybe happening in a couple of places. But what do you what do you do? What do you think about it? I mean, we could even like kind of scroll through the level. Like I have a walkthrough here too, if that would that would be helpful. Oh, crazy. Um, maybe at at a high level, the and this was this was um kind of a virtue of just the game. What one of the I mean, like there's a lot of just differences between it, like making a 3D game and a 2D game. But with a 2D game, you basically like the amount of space you can add. A, I don't know if it's like a just a human brain perception thing i certainly haven't done enough research <laughs> to try to figure this out but it's basically like the amount of like of screen and behaviors and objects and all this stuff the amount of like things in in on the screen that the player can keep in their head is like it feels just based on what we did for most people it's like about you know two like what's on the screen plus about half again as much in any direction and if you start getting like having any the the chunk okay, of level that the player has to has to behave in if it gets a lot bigger than that um it's really easy for like them to just kind of feel like overwhelmed and a bit like either either lost or you could have just unpleasant gameplay situations where they're getting like i mean we, we specifically built the game not to do this but at least in the like initial first versions like people would get shot by dudes that are off screen and that always sucks right um, so just kind of by virtue of discovering that as we were building like a bunch of initial super rough like way before this type encounters that we kind of figured out about the size that an encounter that's kind of how i thought about it a lot when i was building levels it's like okay well here's about a discrete discrete chunk of like yeah okay. mostly the player's gonna have to deal with this much stuff at once like maybe if they really do something crazy they could like drag in a guard from a previous space or whatever but more or less this is how much game they're gonna have to be kind of keeping their head at once and did you try to put um, empty space between those? Yeah, often like <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the the stealth game's best friend, is the air vents, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> does a very good job of segmenting those areas out. Um, I mean, or sometimes you know it's just like a like a wall climb because uh, aside from one type of enemy, like none of the enemies can climb walls, so it's just like another natural way to kind of segment out those spaces, mm -hmm. um, or like just doors and hallways, which like yeah, guards can technically move through, but are both like a mental as well as like game space, physical, like demarcation of space, right? Um, and we figure out, okay, this is about how much space we can expect you to be working with. And you can vary that a bit just to make the encounters feel kind of different. Um, and it's like, okay, well, inside of this space, 
what kind of stuff are we going to have? You know, it's like you have all your different various, like, almost Mario Maker-esque, like, elements like okay we can have these types of enemies because like that's how many have been shown in the game this far like where are the platforms going to be are there are they platforms that guards can go on or do they just kind of like the perch points that just the ninja can go on and just thinking about like as you know as you're kind of populating the space with different things it's like okay well what is you know are are, are we sure that they're like well, one what is what is the what are the things that just keep you from walking from this side to that side and have it being totally boring and lame right okay so then how do we, okay, we broke that up somehow. So now what is one way the player can make their way through the space? Okay, well, what's a different way they can do that based on a different type of play style or whatever else? And then just kind of keep making sure that for any particular encounter, there's not just like one way to do it. Okay. Um, and then, you know, once you, you get would like... You start oh, with, would you start with one way to do it and then like add another one? And did you find that that there was kind of a sweet spot in terms of the number of different approaches to a, a given area and like if you gave them too many did that become problematic or like it wasn't ever really um just it usually wasn't possible to have too many just because like again you're only working with like about a screen right, plus yeah. like a screen later. like there's only oh so much stuff you can put in there <laughs> right right um so it was kind of like it kind of naturally ballasted itself in that way um it was usually far more of a problem of if, well, one, the space just was accidentally harder, the encounter was accidentally harder than was intended, mm -hmm. or two, it's just there just was there's just kind of like one way to do it, and that's not super interesting. Um, so then, you know, you kind of get like a rough idea of it's like, okay, well, what are what what makes this particular encounter interesting? You know, how does it connect to the one before it? How does it connect to the one after it? Like, is there other kind of like objective or plot or whatever stuff has to go in there? Um, and that's then, that's interesting. So you were thinking about like um uh like the connective tissue as well, like you know, trying almost like trying to keep the, the the momentum going always. Yeah, I mean momentum or at least like ensuring that people had some sense of, you know, like where where are they going from here? I mean, it's like it's a two D game. You do kind of get for free, so kind of like yeah, the, yeah, left and you, right. Yeah, you go to the right and you basically maybe go up. This level is crazy because you go to the left. Whoa, yeah. <laughs> but you still also go up. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. <laughs> but there's even there's even subtle stuff in there, like where um for you you think that like you know the the complexities of of a, of a camera system are like that's 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 the bane that's the devil work of like a three D character based game and while that's true um i don't know maybe ninja or clay stuff is kind of unique but like there's a lot of camera work <laughs> inside of ninja um like uh like, hand coded kind of camera work stuff uh i mean uh not hand coded like actually had to define stuff but like there, there's basically a, ca a bunch of camera tools that were built into the level editor right yeah i was saying like like um hand edited i guess by the by yes, the designer yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite a lot of that because it's kind of like you know the way, like how much you push in the zoom or pull it out, like the framing. Like if you bias the camera a bit this way versus that way, that kind of implies oh you should go over here. Right. Yeah, yeah. If you park All the camera of... so that the characters at the right of the screen, you're gonna want to go left and vice versa and that kind of thing. Exactly. All kinds of just basic stuff like that to also um, just kind of reinforce. You know, it's like okay, well that's this is what's happening in this particular encounter, but also you kind of know where the 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 keep going path is um okay so so let me let me um so we sort of we've got sort of a groundwork i, I think that's pretty good about like the what, what you were thinking about so it's like you 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 chunk it down into individual encounters you try to take those encounters and you know give them multiple approaches make them interesting make them varied i assume that context is important you don't want to do two or three of the same type of encounters in a row you give exactly. you give some breathing space in between with vents usually. And those buildings always always have a lot of HVAC uh, in <laughs> really so very, much HVAC. Very good AC in uh, stealth game. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you know even like within the the palette of the areas in between where you're letting people breathe, you're often trying to put some interesting thing there where like you know like you walk under some crows and they fly away, and that's just a little thing that happens in between right. two encounters or whatever. Okay, so also also a checkpoint and a checkpoint, of course. Um, that's another reason I think why the game the game is really hard in an interesting way um without resorting to like babying the player like you guys did a really good job of striking that balance where like you have you have just the right checkpoints and just the right places i want to ask you about the placement of checkpoints because that seems really important in the level too 
Yeah, that was that was another very deliberate decision where um, kind of, you know, the 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 natural tendency that people have is that like if you if um if you have really unforgiving checkpointing and this is it's not necessarily bad or good it's just like this is the consequence of this design decision right right um, if you have really unforgiving checkpointing then generally people tend to be very conservative right right where it's kind of like you know i've got a lot on the line then just kind of naturally people will be like okay well i i know this one thing will work so i'm just going to do that over and over again and that's fine for certain types of games right yep. um but for other types of games, that just has a tendency to be kind of degenerate, and people just end up like boring themselves through success. <laughs> right. Well, and so you, you kind of also very... kind of did that interesting thing where you gave people so many different ways to play each level, right? Like I'm yeah. I'm I'm the silent assassin kind. Like I want to do a no kill, not ever seen run. Like that's just interesting right. to me. I always try to do that. And if you're trying to do that, then the checkpoints are very unforgiving, right? Like it feels really yeah. hard. Yeah. And that's awesome. <laughs> so the idea would be like, you know, if if you do how if you make a mistake then you're like okay well now i learned something right and it's not like oh i learned something but now i'm also pissed off because i have to replay like 10 minutes of this game you're like okay i learned something new now i can apply it and then that encourages people to be like be, be more comfortable with experimenting where it's right. like oh if i do this thing will that guy go over there i, I can try it and see oh no he didn't he blasted me but i learned that he will react in this other way right. aha i can exploit that on my next try right um so that was definitely a very deliberate thing where like not like more or less between e every meaningful like big chunky encounter there's a checkpoint <laughs> right yeah yeah i mean and, and i feel like that those that's not like a super difficult skill a lot of the time it seems like if you play test it you're kind of like yeah that's kind of where the checkpoint needs to go well, Basically, okay. that's one of those things that you discover through playtesting. Yeah, like, yeah. And it's, it's, it's like, just watch the playtester's body language where if they die, but they're still, like, sitting forward and engaged and, like, ready like ready to get back in it, then they're good. But if they die and they're just like, ugh, then you're like, too long between too... <laughs> the current checkpoint and the last one. Right, yep. Yeah, no, that's good. <laughs> like, if they're sad when they see what they're, where they respond. Yeah. If Again, if, if this is the kind of game you want, put another checkpoint closer. <laughs> Well, okay, so, so let me phrase it to you this way, because this maybe is a, a useful frame now that we sort of have this baseline that we're talking about. When you got to the end of working on Mark of the Ninja, when, when you shipped the game, um, how were you better at constructing encounters and stringing them together into levels than you were when you started the game? And what, uh, and what was the skill that you built over time there? Oh, man. Um... How to articulate it? I mean, the well, that's, I was that's the at, problem. I mean, yeah, I'll just put you on the spot there. Was, what, I was better at building levels for Market than Ninja. Um, I mean, a big part of it was that, like, um, I was kind of alluding to earlier that that uh, being able to watch someone play the game, see where the what you built is and is not kind of meeting your design intent, mm -hmm. and then knowing what you need to change to get that there, right? Like, probably, you know, those, I don't have a crystalline memory of it or anything, but, like, probably those first initial places where it was like, I mean, of course it is, but it's always like, oh, that was just a fucking disaster. <laughs> yeah. But you don't know exactly why. And certainly by the end of the project, if it's like, I watch someone play a level, and then, like, they had some difficulty with the encounter, it's like, oh, I know why this isn't working. I know what I need to do to fix it. Right. Uh, yeah, better. yeah, right. We need um, to add a light there, which will force them to go over, which makes them, you know, yeah. Exactly, all that kind of stuff. Um, well, so, so maybe, um, a co sorry, I don't want to interrupt your next point, but I'm interested in some more examples of that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I think that like, and this is this is just a very half baked, off the cuff thought, but I've been thinking about this a little bit ever That's since. That's what we deal in here. <laughs> yeah. Ever ever since you were up here in town talking about this, yeah. it's like you know, with like I was saying, with like sheet music or athletic performance or whatever, where you, your goal, the source of truth, is like, right on the page or right. just like what was your last time for this 5k what is your current time right um that i think that like maybe the best analog for that is just like watching someone who's not you play the game like the, the, the responses they have is that's the source of truth right um with with the with the, ca the caveat and complexity that like obviously that's not an objective thing like experiences are super subjective right so you could only kind of like aggregate it over several different people and then just be like okay well on mass did this collection of people playing the thing get what i was hoping they would get if not 
and if that seems to be bad, then how do I change it to get what I want, right? Um, right. Oh, and so, and then can we unpack that question of how to change it to get what I want? Because I think that's actually the hardest skill to get better at. It, at yeah. least it seems to be to me. Like there, there's kind of there's it's all bound up in the same kind of thing, which is like when you build something, how close is what you built to what you intended, and then right. how many shots does it take you to to get those two things in alignment? Yeah, and the, the like the challenge is that that's like so subjective, right? Um, is like the how do you make it better? Well, it depends on what you're making. <laughs> well, right. Making. Okay, so but I mean, let's so let's be more you know come back to Mark of the Ninja and be really specific, right? It's like you knew that if a player died and they fell back in their chair, that that was bad. Right. Um, can can you think of an instance when you like had to make a change like that 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 you were like. Oh, I, I have just I've just leveled up my ability to do that in the future. I'll never make that mistake again. Or like, you know, I've really learned something from this particular playtest or this particular thing that I had to change. Oh man, I mean, I'm sure there were tons and tons of times where that happened. Yeah. Um, let me think specifically though. I can bring up the video of level four if you want to look at it. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't know if that'll jog anything or not because like a part part of it is. Is that often level design is like, it's about it's often about pacing, right? Um, and pacing is a thing you just kind of get a sense of the more you do it. So I don't know if there was ever like a single, I mean, for like a, a very specific like mechanic or something. I'm sure there was a moment where it's like, oh, okay, this is the right way to put to place the guards who have flare guns or whatever. Um, but for th something that like you know every level has, it's more like. What's what's the right pacing for checkpoints? This is kind of a thing. It's like you just kind of get a sense the more you do it. Um, I know that's that's vague and intangible. <laughs> uh, no, I mean I, I think that's good. It's uh, I mean part of the problem with but, this stuff is that it is so nebulous and intangible, right? And this is exactly the same, sort of thing that me and Davey were struggling with. But I feel like it was a it's a productive struggle, right? To at least kind of think, try to think about it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, part of it is is that, like, you know, like I was saying earlier, right? Like, if someone dies and respawns and their reaction, it's, it's like, in my opinion, at least, like, the, the way you, you get a good sense of all this stuff is, like, how, how do people react to it and how did you want them to react? Or right. if, like, if somebody dies and they're not thinking about, hey, how do, how do, what can I do cool to solve this problem next time that I didn't solve this time? And they're thinking, the game just ripped me off and wasted my time. Okay, I, <laughs> well, I know. I, I know. I need to not make them feel that way. <laughs> but that's the thing that you like. You can't get a sense of that just like looking at your level and seeing where like the yellow icons for checkpoint are in the level editor, right? Right. Like, right. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah. Maybe like the more you do it, that like ideally, right? If you're getting good at at building something like this, um, like the probably the, the the better you're at building it, the more you can. The less you actually have to play test it, right? Like probably, you know, like early on, just keep banging on about this checkpoints thing, but it's like it's a tangible thing. Um, that like I'm sure the checkpointing in like the first couple of levels we built was just trash, and then we just had to like watch a bunch of people get wasted and get mad <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> but I imagine probably the last level I built, the the checkpointing is probably like 90% of the way there, just from the first layout in the editor, just because after watching a bunch of people get wrecked. You're in like, those earlier levels, and yeah. I, I kind of knew in the later levels, it's like, okay, I know about, like, okay, there should be one here, here, here. Yeah. Because the other challenge yeah. was something like like a more, um, uh, a bigger, like, kind of kind of less uh, less prescribed level like this is, you know, often you have to be, con you have to be considerate of, like, oh, potentially checkpoints can be triggered coming from multiple directions. So it's like, okay, well, if someone's taking this path up this way, okay, they'll hit this one here, but if they went around this way and then come back down this way, they'll skip this checkpoint. So, oh, we got to make sure that there's another backup. There's just stuff like that, right? Right. Um, where you're like kind of the 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 gulf between, and this is the thing that we we often had to keep in mind with Fire. One of the, one of the few <laughs> points Parallels. of similarity yeah. between Ninja and Firewatch was often like, um, thinking about you know early on when we were building both of those things like where it's like oh the player is going to be going to play it this way because that's like the one way we imagine them doing that but of course neither game is so prescribed that there aren't multiple ways to deal with it uh progress through it however you want to think about it um 
So <laughs> having to deal with the, oh, but what if the player does this instead, uh, early on in both those games was like, often a source of consternation and challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and then kind of the further along we got in making it, the better we were at kind of imagining all the different ways someone could make their way through the game. Right. And thought, like, how to kind of head, head a lot of that stuff off at the pass. Yeah. Um, well, it's, 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 it's very easy to just kind of, like, in your head imagine, oh, this is, of course, this is how this people will play through this game. But right. that's not a thing you could actually imagine fully unless you're making, like, the most specific, like, on-rails bespoke game ever <laughs> which is my new, which is my new favorite word i keep using that talking about game design bespoke oh good, <laughs> good word. A, you know it's a great word I, I i hadn't used it much until recently okay well but so let's let's talk about um firewatch a little bit then um and then we, maybe we can come back and and go over this level i can stop uh i can stop screen sharing this part because this is yeah, sure. and we'll come back and look at that later um but let's talk a little bit about what I think is really interesting and cool about Firewatch, and I know you, you sort of, in a self-deprecating way, but I understand why, joke <laughs> about how, well, Firewatch is a game with no game mechanics, you know, whereas Mark of the Ninja is a game that's all game mechanics and systems and interrelations and stuff like that. I didn't say no, I just said fewer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you said fewer in a very... Um... <laughs> it, there's a lot of implication <laughs> behind yeah, what you're correct. saying but so okay so the way that i would synopsize it is um heavy hand light touch and i don't mean heavy hand in a pejorative sense i mean in the, in a narrative sense uh you are henry and it says it from the very right. first beginning line you're henry this is what the you did words. this is what you're thinking this is this is how you feel about it and then it gives you some actually like really interesting and touching kind of options to select from and the the selection of those is really interesting to me but i think you know you sort of have this heavy hand in terms of imposing this character and this narrative and not letting the player deviate too much from the core of the of the th sort of narrative through line but you yeah, have this really light touch in the way that you let the player explore the space and like for an example that comes to mind is like uh you go get in, you know, out of the elevator, and you're gonna go get in your truck or whatever. And of course, of course, every player ever is gonna walk around the garage and see, can I like just walk out of here instead of getting in the truck, like doing what I'm supposed to do? You know, they push back. Every player pushes back against that. I'm sure. Oh yeah. Every time. But what's interesting about it is that you just you left the art in that area really plain. You 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 know sort of just like made the space really small. You locked it off, and you just kind of let it ride. It's like you know you you really um you resisted the temptation to put a bunch of shit in there. But you, <laughs> but you still left the space open and let people explore around it. And I feel like it, re it was like a really good setup for the rest of the game. Because it's like, okay, this is what to expect. The game is going to tell you about what the narrative is, and it's going to give you some latitude to experience it, but not too much. But it's going to be really clear about what it what it is uh, and, and how, you, how much freedom you have to explore and what you can do and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, it, what not unintentional like there there is always you know um when you're making you know a, a first person narrative exploration game uh -huh. like there's always this tension between you know <laughs> a literal walking simulator i hate that i term. hate that term so much too yeah <laughs> it's Good. so it's so pejorative but it gets used by people who really like the game whatever anyway continue yeah, it's, it's, your it's actual point a lot of reasons. um that like there's this tension right where you know a lot of those games like the exploration, I think that part is is important. Um, so there's always this kind of trade off between like, okay, well, we need to make sure there's enough space for people to explore and potentially discover some like interesting things, um, but it's never going to be like a humongous Skyrim where it's just like walk off in any direction for as long as you want because I mean, one, that's just not usually that's not the kind of game that a team with those sort of resources. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> but it's also, it's like, you can't fill that much, like, if you don't have a game with, you know, where, like, a friggin' troll or a bear is gonna come charging over a hill, like, you don't, you can't fill that space with interesting stuff anyway, right? Um, so that was often a tension that we had in Firewatch, where it's kind of like, okay, you know, we want to give people, like, enough space to explore around, discover some interesting stuff, you know, like, pal around with Delilah talking about some some things, but then 
it can't be so vast that you just end up like in all these dead ends where there's just nothing there, right? I think um, you, you guys did a really wonderful job of creating just enough space that's just confusing enough that you need to use the map that just lets you get the taste of feeling lost without actually really being lost for very long. Yeah, <laughs> correct. <laughs> uh, I mean, early on, we talked about the game having like a very like Metroid Prime-esque structure, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like, I mean, it, it's, uh, and it still kind of does, but the idea was like, okay, initially you have access to like this much space, and then you'll get something that lets you have this much, and then you get a new thing, which is like, oh, you can get here, now you can get here, now you can, aha, and at the end you get, you get all of it. Um, the tricky bit, <laughs> the reason why that's so much easier to do in a game like Metroid is, you know, you, you get super missiles or high jump boots, whatever, and then there's like, okay, there's the next main place to like keep advancing the game area you can go. But then there's a bunch of like little small side paths you can go down now too. Um, but those games can just put like a mechanical item at the end of those paths. So mm -hmm. it's like, ah, I got the super missile. Now I can get up into this area. Ah, there's a health tank here. Now I have found what I need to find and can move on. Um, <laughs> and you guys, you guys put a, uh, a lockbox yeah, there's like a lockbox or a <laughs> raccoon or a tree with some skis propped on it. So it was just like for us, since we didn't have anything mechanical to put there, yeah. we're kind of like we just got to put more. I mean, kind of the currency of the game is conversations, right? So it's kind of like, okay, there's got to be more stuff to for talk about. To talk about with Delilah, yeah. <laughs> but you hit a ceiling for that way faster. And then the other challenge is because of kind of the – um. The, the, the plot structure of the game, it takes place, the, the idea is it takes place over this whole summer, right? Mm -hmm. but that kind of means that, like, when you're on, if you were to encounter some weird thing on, like, day two, or you're just, you know, getting acquainted and bullshitting with Delilah and stuff, that's very different than kind of the, the narrative context of the game, that if you were to encounter that same thing on the last day of the game, when everything has gone insane. Right, right. Um, so that was another difficulty where it's like, okay, well, even if we put this thing here at this interesting place and we think, oh, the player's probably going to find it on, like, the third day, you still have to answer, well, what if, what they, if don't? they don't? Right. Um, so that was just a thing that, like, we can kind of get away with a little bit of that just because it's like, okay, well, if this thing is behind an item gate – like, if you need the Plasky to get over there, okay, we know you're not going to find it until day 77. Um, but short of stuff like that, it was often quite challenging just to deal with, like, all the possible, like, the, the who, what, when, and where of when the player is actually encountering this thing in a way that, you know, in a more mechanical game. Like, Metroid doesn't care if you find that health <laughs> tank, like... 30 seconds after you get to zero right. missiles or two minutes before the end of the game. Or if you do a um, speed run where you never get any health tanks. Exactly. You right? somehow are, like, yeah. yeah, the game totally doesn't, it doesn't matter. Right, um, right. But for something that's like so narrative, like story focused, it's like you have to care about that stuff. And so it just, it just makes, that's just like one extra complexity when it comes to like, just, it's like, okay, well, what is, you know, it's like, how do we, like, what is the other stuff that we're putting in the game? Now it's just this other requirement on top of that. So, I mean, I guess, um, how did you kind of measure it? Like, was it a, the same kind of thing where you play test it? And then when people that start was... to lose interest, you watch their body language and then you like, okay, well, we should probably put a raccoon here. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, it was partially just, um, just being mindful with the layout, right? Where it's kind of like, you know, if there's ever um, just kind of like where, where, where like the big voids, right? Where it's kind of like, okay, well, there's right. this big windy path that goes up here. What's going to be up there? And it's like there should be – because it's kind of like this signifier of it's like, oh, okay, you've yeah. got – because that's always a challenge, especially with a, with, um, with 3D. Like a 3D, yeah. a 3D mm -hmm. game where it's yeah. kind of like – if someone gets to a place and they don't immediately see where they can move on from there, are they like, oh, did I get to a dead end? I guess this is this path is finished now. Or is it just like, oh, no, there's actually like a little path around that corner of the rock over there that you're just not seeing. Right. Um, and you like having something there that just says, no, 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 you got to the end of the path. And then there was this weird vista. You had a chat with Delilah about like, what's over that way? And then you kind of know it's like, ah, okay, I'm at the end of this path. I can turn around and go back now. Right, um, right. So that so, was the thing that was – 
So and and like um, those signifiers, like giving giving the player those signifiers. Did you did you guys feel like you got a lot better at those at making those and like because it's it's such it's so fascinating to me because it's like you do you do leave big open spaces in the middle of the game and I, I I'm particularly fascinated by the choices about when the music comes in mm -hmm. because I feel like the the music is like a signifier that I'm now traveling over a long right. stretch that's not going to have anything so I should just keep going. Yep. <laughs> that was that was like another way to kind of fill those voids, right? Yeah. Where if like if, if that void is just because you've got to the end of a path, it's like, okay, well there should be an interesting thing there. But if kind of a void of active stuff to do was caused just because you're doing some big traversal where you're like you're not at the end of any path, you're just like walking crossing down a the, lot of yeah. land going from point A to point B, that was off a place where like, oh, okay, well we can trigger some music here and then that will kind of be like kind of change the emotional tone of the scene and it will it will perform it kind of exactly the thing you said where you're like you can just just keep on trucking yeah um, I, I got the two it's kind of like i'm ready to roll like, yeah it's kind of like a quiet um subtle signifier there's kind of like you're doing the right thing you just gotta just gotta keep on rolling pal so how did you come up with all of the because it, it's basically from my perspective it feels like you you started with a story and, and correct me if i'm wrong i got this whole story wrong but if you, you started with a story idea and then you you sort of a pretty loose one a pretty loo and then you sort of came up with like the the layout of the world and the idea for where it was going to be and really thought hard about like it's there's, it has such a strong sense of place it almost feels like the place is a character too like it was such an yeah. important part of what you're doing but then you yeah, came up I'm... with this like palette of like Oh well, if we go to the same location at a different type of day, it's really creepy. And then, like, we find this weird fence in the middle of nowhere, and that's like another weird like piece of the palette. And then there's like a trail of smoke, and that's a palette. And there's sort of like the fires that are off in the distance, and those are another piece of the palette. And then it's like you know the dead ends, and then the notes, and the 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 lock boxes, and like, all of these things to me they feel like they fill the same role in different ways. But so how did you come yeah. up with that sort of palette that then you then used to sort of paint the game world, and how did you decide how to arrange those pieces? It, it was very ad hoc. Let me tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there's any, if there's any lessons to be derived from it, I guess you know I, I guess the the boil down question that I was kind of inching towards with Mark of the Ninja that it's the same kind of question here. It's like if you were going to teach somebody to be good at making Firewatch and making it a good game, what would you teach them? Like, what kind of exercises would you have them do? Yeah, I mean, a lot of yeah, a lot of this is like when we got to the end, we're like, oh, okay, well, if we, if I, you know, if any of us needed to make a game of this ilk again, we'd probably be able to avoid some of the obvious pitfalls that we didn't even know existed when we started. But part of that is, you know, being very aware about what like just what areas of this since again i think that exploration part of it is important right um uh like what areas of the game the player has access to when because that informs a lot of this stuff and you know it it <laughs> it means that you got to fill that space with stuff right um and maybe maybe there's like depending on the premise of your game and i think that like for this type of game especially you are, uh, and I, I actually just, I, I talked in both Vancouver and in Montreal <laughs> about this, but like that, like the, the kind of the, the primary constraint for this in this type of game is, is your premise, right? That like, because, you know, uh, assuming this game is like, because they're so um, like story and narrative focused that you like, you, you, you have to be very mindful of not doing gross fourth wall breaking stuff just because players suspension of disbelief in a game like this is kind of like that's actually all that there is so you really don't want to mess that up <laughs> well, can, can like, you give an example of that like would that be allowing the player to like chase the naked teenagers off into the lake or something gross like that well yeah there's all kinds of stuff like that where it's just you know um if like we did a lot of work to make sure that there's stuff like you know delilah is never going to repeat herself if you keep going down the same dialogue tree like four or five times like there's no way to keep going over the same dialogue you know like in a, in a classic lucas arts venture game right you just ask somebody the same question over and over and they'll just say the same thing over and over right right um and that's fine for, for that type of game especially given the era but if you're trying to make a game there's another character that feels like a real person you know if there's ever just kind of like every time you say x they will respond with y immediately they are not a person anymore <laughs> right well, and you sort of avoided that by embedding all of the narrative in the environmental objects, and then, like, they get used up, right? Exactly. This sort of, like, you know, you were n you're never going to be able to be re-entrant in any of the, the dialogue trees. So it's just, like, that's a thing you have to be cognizant of. But then, 
other stuff like I was mentioning where, you know, if if there was if you could talk about the the weird snowmobiles wrecked in Pork Pond, if you could talk about that the first time you encounter them on day seventy seven, day seventy six versus like five minutes before the end of the game on day 79 and the conversation Delilah had with you about them was exactly the same. Like if it wasn't paying attention to the greater narrative context of the story, right. that the would fact just that the crashed, forest right? is on fire. Exactly. She'd just be like some insane robot. Like it would just be like, Oh, you pushed the button and you made the robot say it's lines. Right. Um, so that was just another thing that we constantly had to be mindful of where it's like, okay, well, when the player is encountering this thing, not only there, it's not just that they're, in this space looking at this thing but there's going to be other stuff that's going on around it as well right and you have to build the reaction to that with all that other stuff in mind well okay um, well, let me so let me ask you this right because we're talking a lot about the game from a perspective of it's like very complete or at least there's there's something there like it almost sounds like we're we're, we're iterating from a point where everything's roughed in what was like the first version of it? Like, where did you even start? You have this rough story. You Bad. Have... <laughs> well, no, um, I, I'm, I'm sure it was like, you know, because you, yeah. you had to invent this new kind of game almost in a lot of ways. Yeah. So like, where, so, where did it start and how did you, you know? Yeah, the way we built it was probably very unusual for uh, a game generally. But like, because the game is built, you know, that, that, that it has that structure of like, each day, here's this stuff. So we actually just built it like day by day. The first chunk of game that we made and first, oh God, it was probably like <laughs> easily the first nine months, maybe the first year. <laughs> the only thing we did, I mean, obviously it was like laying the groundwork, building all the basic systems for the dialogue and blah, 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 blah right? But there's like actual content that was in the game that people eventually played. Right, right. So basically the first nine to 12 months, all we did was like day one, right? When you like, wake up in your tower on the first morning, you go into the lake, you yell at the naked firework teens, you come back to your tower and discover it's broken into. Like, that was basically the only thing we did for the first 9 to 12 months. And it, we had, like, a very rough notion of what the other, like, key locations were going to be, and, like, a pretty high-level notion of, it was like, okay, well, you'll go over to this area on the second day, and then, like, later on, you'll go over to this area. But in terms of, like, the only thing that actually existed in the editor was that kind of the, the we called it the teen loop <laughs> you start at your tower you loop past those teens and you return to your tower actually the final version of firewatch that shipped the unity file that that is the the foundation of all of it is called the teen, teen loop. loop dot unity excellent uh, so okay. that's good i would subscribe to that web ring <laughs> <laughs> geo cities um, that's right but uh yeah so that was kind of like it it was because it we knew what the context of the game was at that point it just kind of naturally compartmentalized all the stuff that we needed to do um and then so so like version one like version one that you play tested with humans who had no reason to be nice to you um what was what was in that you had the so you had the tower was, did you have um like artwork on all the objects that were sitting around in the yep. tower like you, yeah, yeah. you you figured it was so important to the game Freak, freakishly yes like that I mean, and because this was part of the challenge, right? Um, with Ninja, I mean, one, just because it's like a 2D game and we were building from like effectively tile sets. Like once we had the basics in there, it was a lot quicker to get something that was like kind of rough, but was still like quite representative. Yeah. Um, with Firewatch, like we tried to do play testing with um, some stuff that was really rough and it just was like not useful <laughs> just because there, so, there were so many things like, it was clear, like, oh, people are having a problem with X. But because there were so many things that were rough, we couldn't tell why. Right. Okay, sure. So, for, for example, is it, is it... you know, like, like just, um, like, artwork and, like, having all the trees out there and, like, you know, that sense of direction. Like, that, all, that stuff is so important, right? Like, so. Right. So, if, so it's so, like. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, like, you know, if, if like. Because ultimately, like, the thing that people, like, the game is good when people are connecting with the narrative content, right? Right. Um, so it's kind of like, okay, well, the end of this day doesn't feel dramatic and exciting. Why is that? Is it just because the voice lines haven't been recorded yet? So people are just reading the subtitles at the bottom of the screen. That doesn't, obviously, doesn't have right. the emotional impact that, like, a good, well-performed line does. Maybe that's the problem. Or it's like, oh, or maybe the, like the way the props are laid out was kind of confusing. So people didn't see a bunch of stuff and didn't initially realize what was going on or, 
maybe they just got lost getting to here. So by the time they got here, they were just super annoyed and pissed off. <laughs> and so nothing would land no matter what, right? Um, so it was so hard to figure out like what the problems actually were until everything was in at like a pretty representative level of quality. Mm. Yeah. Obviously not like everything's 100% polished and like shipping level, but like a lot closer than you'd like to be on that stuff <laughs> in an ideal world. <laughs> right, sure. But we didn't know any other way to do it, right? Yeah. Um, well, maybe that's the answer. Maybe that's the answer is you just yeah, – for this kind of game. It might actually yeah. be. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was like when we you – know, that was kind of the chunk of game that was just – that was the representative bit. Um so once it was all like relative there and like relatively intact then at that point we were able to you know run a bunch of people through it see what wasn't working and then make adjustments and stuff from there and um, so then what were the lessons that you took from that that then when you started a new unity file that wasn't that was called uh you know fence loop or whatever instead of teen loop <laughs> teen zone teen zone that was that was that was the next one. Teen zone. <laughs> it was. That's that's right. that's where the campsite is. Yep. Where there's like the ripped up Ted L. That's the teen zone. Um, that was uh, never explained in my playthrough. I never came across an explanation for why their tent had been trashed. It is very subtle. Um, what what you discover is that uh uh the the the, the Goodwin did it to uh, basically make make the to basically get the teens to sod off, but then also maybe for them to get mad and like call call like the forest service or something to like maybe get, get you of, in trouble. Right, blah, blah, yeah, blah. Okay, kind of like okay. wrap everything up so <laughs> that hopefully in Henry's mind, this like, oh, this is all done and I don't need to go poking around anymore. All right. this is resolved. Um, and then it was for it was for like some 70 odd days and then things went bad again. Yep. <laughs> I guess uh, I should put a yeah. spoiler warning on the beginning of this video. I guess that's pretty tame. Yeah. Uh, but sure. But also, if you haven't played the game, then why are you even listening to this? Go play the game right now. What are you doing? <laughs> it's not that long either. You should. Right. Um, uh, but yeah, so by the time, you know, when we did that, we did get a better sense of, I mean, even basic things like how to actually implement, you know, all the, all the, um, the different permutations of dialogue in like a way that's more coherent and just from like a total craft nuts and bolts like what are good ways to implement dialogue that has like potentially you know switches and branches in a way that's like easy for someone else to update and maintain and bug fix um because it, it's it's pretty uh subtle like you may not it's one of those things where it's like oh if we did our jobs right you won't notice but like underneath the hood um there's a lot going on in terms of like state management, right? Right. Yeah. There's a lot yeah, of stuff yeah. where it's like, you know, okay, well, because the player looked at this vista, we are going to store that information, and then later, you, it's going to change some line of dialogue. Um, so coordinating that amongst amongst like all the different people that are hooking up the dialogue, because if I call that like, you know, saw pretty vista, but someone else is checking a variable called saw vista pretty. Then pfft, nothing works. Right, right. Um, so even just like there's all the just the basic craft, like how do we actually implement the 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 meat and potatoes of this game? And then at more of like a higher designy level, then it was like, okay, well, after we you know chewed through that day one stuff a ton, then we had a better sense of okay, well, what what is like good pacing in this game feel like? Right. Yeah. So so what did you do then? So you you did you did uh, day one, and now you do teen zone. You did. Yep, teen and now we did. I would just do day two. <laughs> yeah, no, right. Well, so what, what, what was like the rough path of day two? Like, what were the lessons learned where you're like, okay, this is what we know now. We know that we don't want yeah. to put too many of this kind of thing in a row or whatever. Right. It was, it was, it was a lot faster where, because like it's just as easy. Um, <clears throat> and this is a thing, especially once the, the recorded dialogue actually came in, that like when you only have text on the bottom of the screen, like people can read much faster than people can talk. Right. right? Mm -hmm. So like, when we were just doing that, you know, we'd have a bunch of like quick conversations or like objects that you can talk about in quick succession because people would talk about it, like read the subtitle and yeah. then be on to the next thing by the time the subtitle was done. But as soon as you put performed lines in there, it takes like five, ten times longer. So then you look at this thing, start to chat with Delilah about it, and then be walking as you're chatting, get to the next thing, and you want to talk about the next thing, but she's still 
talking about the last thing. Right. So you're like, well, I can either cut her off, but some people don't like to do that, or I just have to sit around and wait till she's done, or I just have to move on and miss that thing and maybe catch it later or whatever. Which is so, which is interesting because I I feel like that like sit around and wait problem is like it's like anathema, right? Like it's just death, <laughs> right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, did you, did you ever play Everybody's Gone to the Rapture? Yeah. Yeah, and it's and it's like they really wanted me to do that, and I I really wanted to because I like them and I like their games, and I really wanted yeah. to participate, but I just couldn't do it for whatever. When there's reason. like when there's like a two minute conversation between two swirly balls of light, and you, you just have the controller in your hand, and you're like, I guess I'm gonna circle strafe around these balls of light for two minutes, just so my hands are doing something. Well, I'm listening to like an interesting conversation, but my hands want to do something. Right. So I guess I'm just going to walk back and forth in front of them until they stop talking. <laughs> and let me tell you about how weird a player I am that this that I couldn't do this. I told this to Steve Gaynor, and he thought this was the funniest thing. I actually, when I was a kid, was never able to do Magic Eye. Really? I, I just never could get it. And for whatever reason, I was like, I was playing Gone Home, and I was like, man, I want to do Magic Eye for once. Like, I finally want to get it. So I sat and stared at the Magic Eye on the wall of her room in Gone Home until I learned how to do Magic Eye. <laughs> so, like, I literally <laughs> I sat and stared at the Magic Eye on the wall and Gone Home for like an hour. <laughs> well, I, I'm glad that game was able to transport you back to a moment you never had in your teen years. In the 90s, yeah. Oh, God. But, and even Good. I, and even I, I could stare at a wall for an hour and gone home, and even I couldn't, I couldn't hang with... Yeah, listen, listen to a 90-second conversation. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, is, like, there's no point fighting that, right? Like, even though it feels... That's, that's what I was gonna, the I point just, I was gonna make, like, yeah. that's kind of stupid, I guess, but it doesn't matter, right? Because, like, almost, that's like an almost you ubiquitous sensation like i'm sure some people are perfectly happy to just patiently sit there and listen the vast majority are not so it doesn't matter so you have to build your game in a way that accommodates that was um, there anything instructive about the difference between text and like the sort of bimodal sensation of listening while walking and looking because I, I feel like it uh, actually feels really different to walk and look at stuff actively while you're being read to, as opposed to having to kind of like engage with the text, which then sort of precludes being able to have your eyes look around the environment. Right. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, that was one of those things where when we just had the subtitles in, especially in that, for that first day of the game, it was very difficult to judge that kind of pacing. Um, after we'd put all that like that first pass of dialogue for all the day one stuff in and then we had a sense of like oh okay this is what kind of good density of objects uh and dialogue and stuff is where it's kind of like and that that you know that can hit um multiple different sort of disciplines i guess right where it's kind of like okay well, we know this area is going to have a bunch of it's going to be pretty dense with stuff to talk about well then one way to deal with that is maybe it's like sean knows that so he just writes all the lines to be like pretty tight and quick and snappy, right? Oh, um, okay, interesting. Or maybe we're just like, okay, well, there's no reason, like, in some cases, just because the narrative context, okay, well, yes, there has to be this cluster of items together because they're all related. So sometimes we can just be like, oh, well, these things don't have to be next to each other, so boop, we'll just pull them further, <laughs> further apart, sure. and then that's a, a totally valid solution. Like, there's often, um, in the moments where, like, Delilah contacts you directly, you know, that's obviously just, like, either a timer or an invisible trigger in the world. We can right. just be like, oh, okay, well, these two conversations, like, oh, this one invisible trigger is too close to this interesting, exciting thing that a lot of people are going to want to talk about. Slide it away. So just pull them apart. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, cool. <laughs> but that was the thing that was, it was very difficult to get a sense of that from just the naive text-only thing. Like, that, once the actual performed lines were in there, it was easier to get a sense of that stuff. Even when, later on, we were doing the same kind of layout with only text, we had a better, like, we could kind of imagine what it would be like a bit better. It was never perfect, obviously. Well, um, yeah, perfect. But it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, even just in terms of, like, getting the, fir the first pass version right. But mm -hmm. probably, you know, by the time we were doing stuff like that on day 76, day 77, whatever, the first version was probably, well, not probably, was definitely much closer than the first draft of day one right. was. And it was all about spacing and layout and the sort of pragmatic concerns of like is, is this attracting too much attention in the environment and like right. yeah okay no that's really cool so and i yeah i've been I, i've been fighting with this a lot um i you know i mean all the voice actors are on strike right now anyway um 
but I, I, I'm. Did you guys ever consider just like recording yourselves doing the dialogue just to have something to slug in there? Oh. Or did you try to do that? <laughs> uh, did we even try to do that? Um, I don't know if we. Oh, we did. <laughs> we did once. We did once. At the very beginning. Yeah. And it was. It was worse than nothing. It was okay. That's interesting. Uh, just because it was, it was so fucking distracting that it was like. Was it distracting oh, to you, or like God. distracting to a playtester? Uh, both. Oh, okay. To, uh, to us especially, but even to the playtesters, they'd be like, "Wait a minute, that bo that's just that asshole that was just talking." Oh, <laughs> God damn it! Um, we tried it with like a text to speech thing. Wow. That was also okay. Not great. <laughs> no, yeah, that just sounds like it would be weird. Um, yeah, apparently, I mean, you can get actually pretty good text-to-speech stuff now. Uh, I think, I was talking to my, my buddy, Seth Rosen, he worked on Bioshock Infinite, and apparently they did that a lot. They did text-to-speech. I think, I think it was Seth that told me about this. Some big game that has a lot of barks, a lot of dialogue, uh, did basically all their scratch tracks with, uh, text-to-speech. Apparently it worked, like, not bad. Pretty good? Okay. Huh. That's it. I, I'll actually, I'll think about that, because... One of the voices is Sarah El Male, but Sarah El Male being uh, a phone AI that's talking to you anyway. So, right, we're probably gonna like robotify it anyway. So, might as well. Yeah. So you might be able. I mean, again, it's not it's not gonna give you the emotional impact you're going for, right. but it may get you like clarity of, oh, this line totally stomps on this other line. Okay, that's yeah. good to know. Yep. Let's move those things apart. That line um, is too long. <laughs> Yeah, stuff like that, where it's like, just, in retrospect, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, of course, people are going to read much faster than words can be spoken, duh. <laughs> but it's the thing you totally just don't consider when you're first implementing this stuff, right? Or or um, they're going to do what all gamers do and not read at all, unless you give them a really good reason to, right? That's right, like, right. that's <laughs> like, <laughs> um, well, I'm going to ask you a really selfish question, then I'm going to come back to the original, like, sort of exercise. How would you teach someone, you know, uh, let's say you hired a, a really smart college grad and you're going to teach them game, you know, te teach them how to make this kind of game. Let's come back to that question. I'm going to ask you a very selfish question first because I'm really interested. Um, <laughs> the, the story in terms of the overarching narrative beats uh, in firewatch for me as i experienced it generally trying to be a good guy you know like i i don't i didn't really like do a bunch of crazy like glitch out kind of try to do weird stuff and go where i'm not supposed to go i like tried to play right. it as, as the character of henry right um i found that very enticing and i like enjoyed that i thought it was really good um but but the the overarching narrative story beats are really strong and like very emotionally affecting and i found myself laughing out loud at a couple points and super spoiler alert when you find out that um the kid is dead like that was very emotionally affecting. So how did you guys write those overarching story beats and kind of tune them and make them work? And also, I feel really bad for whoever had to, like, tune that section over and over again. That probably was a hard week. <laughs> yeah, it was you. Yeah, I bet it was. Uh, that was with me and Jane. Um, like, it's, it's obviously Jane did, like, all the environment art, right? But then there's, like, there's some, like, um, like monologue barks in there. And, and you, I had, you, like, I, covered oh. his head with rubble, which was just, like, so devastating. Yep, Lordy, I had that. That was that part was all Jane, but massaging those triggers, I had to basically run through that scene over and over. And it's the kind of thing where it's like I'm sure people who work on really gruesome like body horror movies yeah. are just like, it just looks like a sandwich. I don't care anymore. Right. Um, you get used <laughs> to it, but yeah, it was intense. I'm very glad that I did not have a child when we were working on that game. That's Ooh. for sure. <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine. Both, yeah, both both me and uh, another person at Campo um, had kids. After the game came out, and we're like, I mean, that's that's good for a number of just life reasons, but also it, I suspect it made that stuff a little bit easier for us to build. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh. Anyway. Uh. I mean. I mean, part of it is just like just the intangible. Have people who are good, like <laughs> obviously. Well, I mean, at a, at a moment to moment level, like what, like um, you. you was it you who like wrote the story beats or like how did how did those those narrative beats come together and how did you write them down even like did you write down just like like boring kind of thing a happens then thing b happens then thing c and we're going to fill out the dialogue and the the emotional beats or like how did you how did you I mean, arrive at the writing because the writing is like like kind of literary quality prose i feel like yeah. and that's pretty rare in a game and you guys really yeah. you clearly did that intentionally so how did yeah, you I arrive mean, at that Fortunately, the actual like dialogue is just that's just like oh Sean is very good at that. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So how how he is good at that that's a question for him. I don't know. <laughs> um, I know he reads a lot. That probably helps. Uh, Does he do a lot of writing? 
I uh, for games he does. I don't know if he does huh. not games writing. Interesting. Um, yeah, but uh, like the the just the high level story beats. That was just a lot of like you know collaborative brainstorming. Like, what do we want this stuff to be? Um, uh, and then you know when it's usually the flow is like yeah yeah some amount of like story meetings that would involve you know Sean Jake and then any other number collection of people as appropriate um then Sean would go off and write the script and then we'd like implement the first pass of it and then as soon as like that rough just the the script dialogue stuff was there we're like okay well what else do we need to kind of carry the scene because obviously like you know we're not making if like the words right. alone are not sufficient right right um they're kind of like that's the bedrock that's the foundation but like all the stuff around it has to kind of bring the words to life so then it's like okay we'll talk to jane about like you know okay well what do we want the layout to be like how do we want to and then again keeping in mind like the other considerations where it's like you know if you have this big emotional moment but then right next to it there's like a goofy thing you can make right. a joke about probably don't want to have those like right next right to each other there, there. yeah <laughs> And that, that could be, like, in the way you deal with that could be any number of Because, like, you know, there's crazy heavy stuff that happens in the tower. There's also, like, jokey shit in the tower. So it's kind of like, okay, well, uh, during day 66, we will just turn that off. Because <laughs> we example. don't want you to hear about, you know, to be telling her about your wife and then make a joke about, you know, uh, that Turt goofy Reynolds. That D&D map. Yeah, or that, <laughs> right? Fucking Turt oh. Reynolds. Uh, I love that. Classic. Oh. Classic. Mm. Um, ah, so good. <laughs> yeah, but that, that was the kind of thing where it's like, you know, you have a bunch of different tools in your tool belt. You know, in, when you, you, you come upon poor Brian's body, like, part of that is like, okay, you know, we're going to have a music cue, right? So it's like, right. okay, well, Chris has to write a music cue, and then you have to figure out, like, you know, we got to place it. But then there's even, like, very, again, mundane workmanship, like, considerations in there where it's like, you know, if you do stupid shit, we're like, I'm going to walk into that room backwards. And they're like, well, should do you, do you cue the music like just when the player walks into that room? Do you do it when they like look at a specific thing? No, remind all kinds of remind me. Did you do a camera snap a little bit? No, we, there's actually only one place we did that in the entire game. Okay, um, and I think it doesn't feel very good. Uh, I didn't notice it standing out. Where was it? That's good. It's, it's uh, on the very first day when you see that guy up above you on the rock with the flashlight. Oh, it makes you look um, up. It'll kind of pull your th – it, like, it, it's not 100 – it doesn't, like, completely grab it. But if you're at all looking that direction, it <laughs> magnets you up there. And it, I think it feels kind of weird, and I don't like it. Mm, um, okay. I didn't uh, – but it, it didn't stand out to me. But, I, I mean, I know why you did that, right? You it's have, like – You might have already been looking at the dude, well, too, Well, in, right? in FPS, the players will never look up past, like, you know – 60 degrees. Nobody looks at the ceiling no ever. No one will ever look up, yeah. I deal with that all the time. In, <laughs> the the only thing that gets away with that is Dishonored. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because the way you move to that game is above everybody. Like, that's your that's your concealment, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, the, um, so it's just, you know, it's, it's, you know, knowing, like, okay, well, what are all the tools we have in our tool belt, and which ones, well, can we even at all deploy in this scene, and then which ones are going to be the most effective um yeah yeah i guess maybe just like that was just a well-written piece of narrative right like that was a good twist i guess it 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 helps to work with people who are very good at that stuff <laughs> yeah yeah no and I, I mean I'm, I'm playing it and i'm like god this is really good i want to get better at this but i don't know how so i was just kind of from a selfish perspective from like writing a narrative and having these beats that kind of land but i'm also not really making a game that's about that but i still kind of want that although i mean i feel like um I'm, I'm not blowing smoke up your ass continuously. <laughs> but Mark of the Ninja is really good. Like, it has a really good story. For a game that is so mechanically focused, the story is super engaging. It has exactly the number of, like, beats that it needs to, and it wraps up super satisfyingly. And even though right. I, like, I, I kind of guess what the end twist would be a little bit, it, I was like, that is a really good ending. Like, that ends really well. Like, that's super satisfying. It's It's yeah. way not, like, out of scope. Like, the ambition is perfectly matched to the gameplay and it doesn't overstay its welcome and stuff like that yeah that that oh god that one was that was a while ago so i don't remember exactly how we got there uh i mean that was that was largely i mean me and chris dolan were jamming on that stuff a lot with some help from you know, a couple of you know a bunch of other folks at clay as well like the lead animator aaron and the lead environment artist meg were super involved with that stuff too um, oh, that's cool 
I don't remember exactly how all that stuff came about now. Like, I think probably from the outset, like, the notion of Aura and then her not being, like, this weird figment and not being real. Like, I think – I don't think there's ever a point where it's like, oh, no, she's a real lady running around in the world. Oh, but what if she wasn't? I think, like, kind of from the outset, that notion of, oh, she ain't real. That was, was always there. Yeah. There. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I don't remember exactly – the how and the why of how that came together, but that was definitely there from the beginning. Oh, that's cool. That's good to know. So it's basically just yeah. like some good ideas, yeah. Oh man, I'm trying to remember now. Yeah, I don't know. I, like, I don't think it was pure because I, I was talking to um uh, a student actually who's like a who like wants to do more game writing stuff here in town not too long ago, and I kind of mentioned that like more so than other types of prose writing for games is it's it's super 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 about solving problems right where like in your novel if you need a character to do a thing you have total control over it you're just like (laughs) i will concoct some outward force that makes him do this thing problem solved yeah yeah but in a game, you don't have that option, right? Like, it's like, oh, the player's going to do whatever the fuck the player wants to do. I mean, uh, of yeah. course, like, bound, bounded by the confines of, like, what is, like, mechanically possible in the game. But in some of that, they're just, like, they're going to do whatever the hell they want. So, you know, you, the, the writing in general, like, all the story stuff has to be way more focused on solving problems. It's just kind of like, you know. Problems of con- conceit, like, almost. Because I, I feel like the, the, the CB yeah. radio as the narrative interface is, like, super good. Yes. Like that's a really that's, that's not a mistake. <laughs> no, well, obviously not. No, it's it's such a nice. It's like this is a real person, but there but there's a reason why you you can only talk to them, and they're kind of your boss. So there's a reason why they would be telling you to do things, which is really helpful from a task standpoint, and you can kind of make fun yeah. of it, and you can really develop this other character. But they can kind of see you, which is a little creepy, and you can you never you don't have like a a, a way to look back and see them, which is really interesting, and like yeah, yeah I don't know. It's a it's like um almost like what it what the device is that delivers the narrative is more important than so many other parts of it yeah that it it that kind of like the, just the, because you know the premise has to sit on top of like all this stuff the player is actually doing that you just have to be so much more mindful of like how how does how does the writing of the story like how does it react how does it mesh with all that stuff because yeah in just about like you know any other type of like prose storytelling media it's like you don't have that problem yeah it's right just <laughs> just, it, just it does, write it. it yeah it does what you told it to do right. even if you have to have a human perform it they're still performing what you told them to perform right um but in a game you do not have that option <laughs> it affords um, other opportunities okay exactly so, <laughs> okay so returning to the less selfish question which which was um and this is this is kind of where i'm going to start wrapping up I don't want to monopolize too much more of your evening, um, but we're having a good time, which is awesome. I feel like we could talk about Mark of the Ninja mechanics for like a weekend, so we should probably, probably. just try to be, because I, I love that game, and there's so much to talk about, and there's so much I, game there. Yeah, I've been playing Dishonored 2 a lot, so I'm like, I'm, my brain's all back in stealth game ooh, mode now. Okay, cool, yeah. <laughs> so don't don't crack the lid of this Pandora's box too much, Steve. We'll I will in a done. minute, I will in a minute, but let's let's wrap up Firewatch, and then we'll go back to Mark of the Ninja. Um, but so, it, let's say you, you hire a, a really smart kid, who, and you want him to work on your new game that is kind of like Firewatch, or takes a lot of the same lessons. What do you teach them? Like, you, you want to give them some exercises so that you don't have to just watch them fumble around and fuck it up 20 times. You want to, like, you want to, like, get them good fast. Right. How do you, what do you tell them to do? What do they practice? Oh, man. Um, what would an exercise look like? Would it be like, hey, here are, you know, 10 lines of dialogue that are recorded. Here are 10 dialogue cues. Here's, like, a bunch of random pieces of art, like, um objects and here's like the unity editor make an environment and make it an interesting flow of narrative out of these objects and these words like yeah maybe um i mean off like in with a lot of stuff like kind of the 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 process the pipeline whatever with firewatch is like okay well what's the what's the premise like what's the what's the story beat that's happening okay here's the script here's like the rough gray box layout now we have to kind of mesh them all together right um so if you did indeed like have you know the 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 dialogue and the 
you know, the, the dialogue was, of course, all written in response. Well, I mean, it was, it was partially reactive, you know, sometimes it would be like, oh, we laid out this environment. Oh, Jane thought it would be cool if there was like, right, some garbage, like a garbage pile here. It's like, okay, well, now we need to write some dialogue to talk about the garbage pile. But in general, it's kind of like there's like a high imagination, like, okay, we concepted what's going to be in this space. Okay, that informs the stuff you can potentially talk about. Yeah. Um, and then when you have all that, okay, well, what's what's a good way to lay it out? So probably an exercise could totally be, you know, okay, well, here's here's the props that have a, lines of dialogue associated with them. Lay them out in an interesting way um, that is, you know, is is meaningful to move through. That like, especially if it's a it's a little bit bigger, because if if you're talking like room scale, it's kind of like there's only so much you can do, right? Right. right. Um, but if it's like, you know. A, a, a brisk walk, like mm -hmm. two to three minutes of walking worth of game, yeah. then you're making a lot more choices about just like where stuff is and how it gets laid out and blah, 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 blah. And thus you have to be a lot more mindful of the experience. And probably a part of that too is like at the beginning, kind of, you know, artic being able to articulate what you want moving through this space to feel like. And then seeing, you know, when you have a draft, how close is it to that? Um, right. And so, I think it's, that's, so would that's part of the thing. exercise be to to have the person write down, like she writes down what the player is supposed to do or how how she expects them to feel at a certain point or like what you yeah. would see from a play test and then you run a play test and see how close it is? Yeah, totally. Because like, you know, the end, like off, there's plenty of shit on day one where it's like, like when you... <laughs> <laughs> you get what, what we call the pun run, where <laughs> if, if, if you talk to Delilah about lightning and then she just goes through that terrible series of electricity puns. Which were excellent. Uh, they're, they're incredible. And Sissy, Sissy nails just like every one. So good. <laughs> um, but like that's like this kind of jokey, lighthearted thing, right? But then the very, very end is like totally creepy and weird and kind of supposed to be like kind of unsettling. Right. Um, and everything's so, like fire. <laughs> No, I mean just like the end of that day when someone has broken into your tower. Oh yeah, right, um, yeah. Like that, like a lot of that, you know, there's like a little bit of kind of more intense stuff in the middle when you're dealing with those goddamn kids. But then, it, like, it chills out and it's kind of like just jokey and more chill, getting to know each other, whatever. But it, then it ends on that kind of more intense note. Um, so there's kind of like a bit of an emotional spectrum there, and that was not an accident, right? Oh like, right, yeah. That's kind of how we wanted that area, wanted a, that how yeah. that feel. But like, okay, well, how did how did we actually do that? And then if someone could articulate, okay, well, I wanted the, this chunk of the game to feel a bit more intense or, or, or spooky or ominous or whatever, then it's like, okay, well, is, is this bit of game doing that? If it's not, well, what can we change to do that? It's like, maybe we just need to kind of add some creepy synth music. Because <laughs> that, goes, that goes a long way. Right, right? yeah, yeah. Music um, is huge. Yeah, or is it like, you know... We need there needs to be a little bit more anticipation. That that's kind of like you know the fact that um, when you when you get back to your tower, your typewriter is on the ground, and as soon as you look at it, there's this stinger that starts that like kind of dun, 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 like creepy synths, right? Um, so it's kind of like okay, well that's kind of what sets up. Oh, something seems weird, and then you get up to the top of the tower, and then there's like the ah shit, the windows are broken in, and the doors open, and shit's trash and everything. Um, but Maybe that scene wouldn't land quite as well if you didn't have that moment of anticipation. Right. So it's kind of like, oh, okay, well, what – so that's just kind of like a thing where it's like, you know, if, if the exercise was to build a small chunk of narrative exploration game that kind of had some intensity to it and it wasn't landing, okay, well, maybe that's because there needs to be a little bit more anticipation. It can't just go from, like, zero to ten. Sometimes, sometimes that works, right? Like, that's, that's, that's fucking score. how jump scares <laughs> yeah, work. Yeah, jump scare, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but often – that you like that that cannot be your only only go to. Um, <laughs> well, so, there are some games on Steam that prove that that's the case, but I feel like uh, yeah, if you want to make a really high quality <laughs> game, yeah. <laughs> it cannot be an infinite parade of jump scares. An interesting question that are, that then arises in my mind because I, I think that's really good, and 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 you're you're doing a pretty good job of it. It's it's like still pretty nebulous. It's like well, it needs to like feel good, right? But but you're doing a pretty good job of being specific about what would feel better or worse, or like the types of things yeah. that you might run into. So what, well, I think yeah, I think the important thing is you kind of. You, at the beginning, you're able to articulate a little bit more specifically than just feels good, right? You're like, right. oh, I, we want this moment to be funny or suspenseful or just kind of like, you know, just a moment of like idle exploration where not too right. much is going on or whatever. Like, and you can articulate what this is more specifically than just it's good and then measure at the end how close is it is to that. And then if it's not, 
the how you get it there obviously varies a ton on what the output you're trying to get right right yeah so it'd be so i would say like i want to have the tension slowly ratchet up and the creepiness and then have it broken by a laugh at the exactly. end and then the, yeah. and then it cuts to the next day yep yeah exactly so it's like that okay that's a, that's because that, like that gets you want to, to loop it all the fucking way back to the beginning maybe it's like that is that's your actual specific more measurable right more articulated goal right 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 and right, then right. you know then you have something to kind of like test what you're what you've been building against right like yeah. obviously it's not as specific as play f sharp and then d flat right right but it's still something but more i than mean just, you know should be good People who are making movies, you know, they don't they, they do exactly. the same kind of thing. You know, it's, it's the yeah. same. You know, you watch people in a focus group and you try to see like what how they're reacting and you know, is it what right. you're looking for and stuff like that. Um, what would be like the master class version of that? Like, is there something that you you would want to do that would be so ambitious that you just don't even think you could do right now that you could see would be a skill horizon you might be able to reach if you kept developing this? Like, if you guys made, you know, five oh, more man. games that were like Firewatch, but you tried to push deeper and deeper into like i don't know what you would even call like emotional engagement or complexity of narrative or i don't know it's just it's like if you don't have an answer off the top of your head that's totally fine i just it's yeah. just a, it's just something that occurred to me oh. as you were talking about that because it's really interesting yeah i don't know really i guess it's sort of I mean, unknowable unless you walk the path to arrive there because you're yeah. kind of building okay. the staircase as you're walking up it yeah, I mean, again, just because, like, the game is so – it's so, like, bound up with the premise and the story that we were trying to tell, it's like I don't – another one of those would just be, like, a different story, a diff <laughs> right? A different story with a different emotional tone, and yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I don't really – Something to ponder, I guess. Yeah, that's an interesting to think about – interesting thing to think about. Yeah, I guess I, I'm thinking about like, um, uh, I feel like, uh, I guess, yeah, it was, it was John Blow was talking about how like, you know, witness is related to parade in certain ways. It, like he has this idea of sort of nonverbal communication, and he's like just trying to go deeper and deeper along that same axis. And it's just interesting to think right. about like, is there another, you know, is there another way to articulate a, a deeper axis that you might go down? Yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm sure there is. I just don't know exactly what it would be. I mean, maybe it's like you know. <clears throat> either pushing and i don't know if this is better it's just different yeah it's harder it's harder so maybe that that counts but yeah, it's like yeah what's well, so it harder is interesting yeah. right like pushing either the the non-linearity or the reactivity right like right part oh, of the okay, reason sure. why firewatch even fucking works is that we do have that kind of metroid day based structure where we know you're only getting to this much game and then you're getting to this much game but if it's like and i don't even know if this would be good right, right. But if it's like oh if you just had the whole game from the beginning, would that even work? Would that be good? I don't know if it would be good. Right. It would be different. It would be different. What would <laughs> it, it be different? It's interesting. It's like, what would it buy you, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's like, I mean, that's an interesting thing to think about, though, because at least, mm -hmm. the, like, it would be harder. It would be harder for harder sure. Harder to make, yeah. I don't know if it would be harder just because it's it's worse. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, so you have to do more work to make it good. Right. <laughs> um, but it's certainly an interesting thing to uh, to think about. Yeah, yeah, I'm just idle pondering. So, yeah. Okay, so then last, um, well, penult penultimate question. The same same kind of thing with the Mark of the Ninja level four. You know, you've got a smart kid who's coming in who's going to work on Mark of the Ninja two. How do you yeah. get him up to speed as quickly as possible? Can you run him through different exercises? It, is it a yeah, very for, for, yeah? Fortunately, that one's way more discreet. It's just like to sketch out an encounter, build it. And then we will play it, and we will see how how it, like how how much it meets the high level goals of the game, right? That that like cheesemo pyramid of like observe, plan, execute. That that was like ultimately our source of truth, if you will, right? right Where it's sure. kind of like that's like that's the stuff that like that's the reason why I think fundamentally, basically, all stealth games are interesting. So you know, for this particular chunk of the game, how well is it? doing like how much is it affording the player can do those things that make this type of game interesting and, um, and let me try I, I'll, I'll try and impose something and then you can correct me but like let's say you were trying to give some standard of performance on it that was more codified like 
One thing would be, you know, does it have the sweet spot in terms of a number of different approaches that different players, you know, does it does it fit uh, fun for a lot of different kinds of players, like a lot of different players find it interesting? Is it the right amount of challenge for this particular point in the game? Is it contextually situated really well? Does it use the mechanics in an interesting way, you know, is it it's not repeating itself too much you know like right. yeah all the all those kinds of things that would be that would be like my sort of criteria yeah exactly that you know you're just able to um yeah that th those are the kind of it's like it, it should also be good but those those are kind of the, the slightly more articulable articulable sure articulatable uh, thing, yeah <laughs> articulatable, whatever yeah. uh that that make that good right where it's kind of like okay there there are indeed a bunch of different approaches to this it feels relatively novel um how well does it engage with the abilities you may have just encountered Stuff oh right like yeah okay yeah so you're, you're wanting to like give the player fun ways to use things that they've just gotten that they're just thinking about yeah Stuff like that. Um, or is this like, is this introducing a new type of challenge? Okay, well, is it introducing it in a way that is like clear? You know, because it, it like every time we re introduce a new enemy type, we try to do it in like the, oh, here's just one of these guys alone doing the thing that they do that is special. Right. Because if you just like happen to, I mean, one, it's, yeah. it's kind of like it just makes the moment land a little bit better and people are like okay this is a new thing i need to pay attention to because it's just like oh randomly in this room there's a guard that has a different un colored uniform and thus he behaves completely differently that it just like it would do a poor job of signaling to the player here's a new thing you need to pay attention to right right um, but it just like you're also kind of like <laughs> you're, you're wasting a good opportunity there right well actually um, so so this is really interesting because i you know i think about this a lot i think about puzzle grammar and i think about introducing new mechanics and i think about how to do it in a way that's not so like hit you over the head with it like colin calls it the idiot tutorial for idiots and he like <laughs> laments that he always seems to have to revert back to the idiot tutorial for idiots because All right because it just is the only thing that will work for everybody but yeah. um like there's a lot of subtlety in the way that you introduce a new mechanic. I used to do a, a level design class that I, at a, I used to teach at a game design college in Phoenix, and I, I used to have people pick a mechanic in Super Mario World, and then they had to make a series of three levels all based on that same mechanic, and they had to start from a point of view of like, no one, someone knows nothing about this mechanic. You have to introduce mm. it in a way that is organic, and then yeah. by the end of it, by the third end of the third level, you're giving them a really difficult challenge along the lines of those mechanics. But like, right. if you're looking at a, a mechanic that you're introducing. What's like the what's a what's like a master masterful way to introduce it that really makes makes it feel organic for the player and not like it's a tutorial like it I guess it's like y you give them a way to figure out how to do it without you having to have a big flashing button and then you also it's like a cool thing that they get to do immediately with it right yeah I think that's part of it um you know part of it is like there's definitely the masterful way to do it is often kind of smoke and mirrorsy where you're like <laughs> We're gonna do non-systemic mechanical things to make this seem cooler, <laughs> um, which is actually not like you know, fucking Portal is the master of that, right? Where you're like, oh, you're yeah. doing a really boring, like, easy to understand thing, but because like all the environment, like, you're in this weird environment, you're trying to figure out like what the hell is going on. You know, Glados is talking to you in some amusing yet sinister way, that like you know, there's all these other parts of your brain that are occupied thinking about other cool things. So you don't kind of don't notice that it's the idiot tutorial for idiots. Right, right. <laughs> it's, I found um, particularly fascinating the difference between the intro tutorial in Portal 1 and Portal 2, because they basically redid the same tutorial. Right. And it's way better in Portal 2. And I, right. thought, it, and I thought it was really good in Portal 1. Anyway, sorry, yeah. I interrupted you. No, no, totally. But that that's part of it where it's like, you know, there's you're going to do it in a way that and there, there's some bits in, in ninja where it's just kind of like to play the game like a competent person you're just going to need to understand this or we're just going to lock you in a goddamn room and do it. <laughs> right sorry buddy there's something like you know sometimes the most masterful way to do it is just like be be explicit be simple and just get the hell out of the way right. um because like that's often where where the the shit can fall down is when like you have the idiot tutorial for idiots but then you like kind of leave people in their water wings for like another hour um as much <sighs> as much as i love nintendo and i do, i was just gonna say skyward I so sword <laughs> i was gonna yes. say skyward sword Le the recent legend of zeldas in particular have have been quite infected by this virus where it's like you can you like the first the first time you introduce a new thing is like totally explicit and boring as like as long as it's fast it kind of doesn't matter right but then it's like if you act like the player has been kicked in the head by a mule <laughs> for another 90 minutes, 
maybe mm. not the best. I, I feel like that that it's sort of the end of a dark road that you can go down if you rely too much on playtesting, though. I think again, it's yeah. playtesting is always you know, it's all about taste. It's all about synthesis. It's all about seeing the right seeing with the right eyes i guess is a weird way to think about it you know seeing yeah, yeah totally you can watch 10 people play a level and they all get through it just fine except for one person who gets stuck but that's like the actual really important thing that you need to address and it's like oh that that's really really important like i you know you yeah I yeah to, to to make it work for the one person the answer is not to make it bad for the other nine people <laughs> well I, I was just thinking in terms of like you didn't realize it was actually bad for the other nine people until you oh, saw I that one person fuck up in a particular, you know, it's like these just these weird little right. things that you see. Yeah, that's kind of a weird taste thing. Yeah, 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 I think it's like it's really important to be mindful that like yes, you you can technically you know you can keep someone safe by locking them in a padded room and only letting them outside of their house in a, in, a, <laughs> in a respirated bubble suit. Right. But <laughs> probably not actually the best way to raise a person. <laughs> yeah, you gotta let them. You gotta let them fumble yeah, so around and fuck thing. it up. Yeah, totally. But just making sure that, like, you know, they, in general, people feel they have the, the freedom to do that. And, you know, there's, like, good best practices of, like, if someone's get confused, they can return to a safer space or they, they have an easy reference to figure out the way to do a thing. Or there's just, like, other ways to do it. So if they don't figure out the one way, but they are perfectly happy doing it this other way, cool. Yep. Yeah. And, and you have to you have to decide if that's cool. Is that cool? Does yeah. that fit with the game? Does that work? Yeah, I guess that yeah. works. Yeah. Exactly. Sweet. All right. Um, well, I'm... Like, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of pinch things off unless you had something you were about to launch onto that's super dope. Nope. Nope, that's good. Yeah, cool. And I was sort of and then I get the last thing I like to ask people is a non craft related thing, which is more just like how do you kind of keep your energy up day to day? How do you keep plugged in? How do you kind of keep going oh, and get stuff done? Because I feel like all of this deliberate practice stuff is predicated on the idea that you're actually able and and you, you can sit down every day and just crank, right? Like, and really, yeah, like... Put in, put in the put fucking it, ass it, in chair put, time. Yep, ass in chair time. And, like, productive ass in chair time. So I just, I like yeah. to ask people that as kind of a wrap-up question. Oh, man, it's really hard. <laughs> with a baby. <laughs> I, yeah, there's that, too. Um, yeah, like, working from home with a tiny child, that's difficult. Because right now, um, kind of the, uh, everybody in San Francisco Campo is, is figuring out, you know, kind of what they want to do for the next big thing. So, and I'm doing a, a small side project right now, which is basically just me and some other people who are not where I am. Ooh. So it's just kind of like, it's, it, it's, it's very, very small. Very I want to see. I want to see. Petite. Uh, but it's kind of where it's like, oh, man, yeah. I, I remember when I worked alone all the time in grad school, and I <laughs> fucking hated it. Yeah, it was the worst. Yeah. Now I remember why I hated it. Um, so I think, like, part of it is just finding ways to keep yourself honest. Like, having someone you, – you mentioned this when you were up here. You had your – what is it, like, cool brain, sweet oh, brain <laughs> society? No, the, the uh, Impossible Club. There you go. Yeah. Um, that like having some other people, even if they are not actually invested in your success in any way, but on a friend level, yeah. that just like having somebody else to keep you accountable, that you can just be like, in a week, I'm going to show you a cool thing. Um, that kind of, especially for me, like accountability and deadlines, I am very poor at setting them for myself, but I cleave to them heavily when someone else sets mm -hmm. them for me even if i just tell that other person to set them for me right and okay. they don't actually give a shit um that is a thing that i find tremendously valuable and even extrapolating that outward that was the moments in campo where we were on firewatch where we were for sure the most successful was when we knew we had a, like a big specific deadline for you know we're doing this crazy playable demo thing at GDC so we need to have this chunk the of the giant game, like fire tent and all that correct <laughs> you already you already put down the deposit on the fire tent <laughs> <laughs> that we need to have like the game seriously rock solid playable in the amount of game we're going to demo by this day and those were always the times when we just like yeah somehow that's when we like mixed jet fuel with the diesel and just went crazy mm. obviously like you can't do that forever you'll yeah, catch you'll... on fire and die yeah. <laughs> um, but those moments were always like when we know this we're like right we can't always harness this but we know it's a thing that like when we need to we can just like yoke ourselves to the rocket and go yeah um so that was good uh with um I was up here working remotely for all of Firewatch, basically, but we had a setup effectively identical to this. For most of the time, we actually even freaking use Google Hangout. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
just so it's just like in the in the office in San Francisco, it's just like a big ass TV at the end of the room. You know, at the start of the day, I just jump into a hangout and then my big disembodied face just, <laughs> just, just be sitting be on there. this TV. Yeah. Um, but that was like as good as being in the uh, almost as good as being in the office, right? So it's kind of like you know, I had my confined work day, and then we had all like the project task management shit just to talk about but just even that was like okay cool here in the office actually doing work all right we're focused go 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 um so that was really good in any future like remote collaboration i might do i definitely will have that same setup even if everyone's working from their house right we're still all just gonna webcam it up because that (laughs) makes it so much more real than I'm just sitting here in this windowed office. I guess I'm working, but I'm also reading the CBC's website or whatever. Or whatever, yeah. yeah. No, it makes it easier to stay on task. Yeah, that's cool. That's great. That's awesome. I, I'm going to invite you to remotely attend Impossible Club sometime if you're down for it. Oh, man, hell yeah, for sure. Yeah, we just like... Um, would send you a uh, Steam key and you can, you know, grab the grab the games. And we, we like to do um, generally just like one person per week will like play test. And we'll just mm, like they'll be they'll be the one in the chair basically. Yeah, well, and we'll have one person one 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 person's game will be getting play tested and discussed. Right. Yeah, cool. That's a lot of nice continuity there. All right, Jude. Well, it was a delight to see you. I think that was a, yeah. a pretty interesting conversation. Like we kind of yeah. got over a lot of ground. It was really cool. I got a lot of really cool insight into Mark of the Ninja, and I, these the design docs are wonderful. I got you. You have to find some way to put these up for people to find. They're so good. Man, yeah, I gotta. This is the, the the one page design is actually a thing that I got. Like, it was one of those GDC talks that you go to, and you just walk in, and you're like, "This is actually." It's not like, "Oh, I have these interesting other things to think about." It's like, "Oh, here's this very fucking specific thing." Right, I really concrete. Do. Yeah. Yeah, and that was the thing that Stone LeBrand, um, from yep, was it Max's for ages? I forget where he is now. Uh. He was my, he's my like, first game design professor in college. Oh, shit. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, so he's just like, yeah, just do this. And I was like, this is very good. I will do this. <laughs> so, and that was like the, the core gameplay loop one with the sort of triangular one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all of those were just like, okay, put a bunch of stuff on one page, kind of make it as infographic as you can. I am very bad at visual design and even worse at drawing. So <laughs> it's like, here's a crappy thing that even I, the least visual person, can do. Um, it's interesting because I, I looked at I, I, I went through all the documents that you shared to me because they were so interesting. But I mean, there, there really were. Um, it, it showed your type of thinking, or at least oh. it showed the way that you seem to like to think about things, which is very systemically and state based. Like yeah. you, you have a lot of state flow diagrams. Yes, there. That was definitely a. Uh, uh, that was a lot of. That, that is generally how I like to build things. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, that, that worked on Ninja quite well, I think. Sort of programmatically too, right? Yeah. I mean, that's my background, right? Like, I got two degrees in computer science. That's how I think about this shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's cool. Yeah, you know, it, it's really interesting to see how that applies to such a, you know, sort of uh, narrative-heavy, narrative-focused game. It's still, like, states, but it's, like, emotional states almost. <laughs> right. Yeah. Cool, dude. Well, I will let you go, and I'll let you know about Impossible Clubbing. And, awesome. And um, thanks again. Internet high yeah. five. Send my love to all the Ooh. Vancouver folks. Oh, I, I should, certainly will. All right. All right. Talk I'll to talk later, to you dude. soon, buddy. Bye. Later.